As teased, Speedball Mike Bailey finally makes it onto his favorite wrestling podcast, a wrestling perspective with Lars Fredericks and myself. Speedball, thank you so much for a making this your favorite go-to wrestling podcast. I know you've listened to all the episodes with all of our guests. Uh, not to put you on the spot, what was your favorite? Uh, the one with Mickey James. Shit, he was he my was. favorite. Yeah. Love that yeah. one. I was just making all that up. This you, you know what that? You know that was a karate chop right to your dick, Dennis. I know. I that uh, was that was like quick. He, he like came out with Mickey James. He's like, you know, Rolodex of Impact players. Someone right. That's what uh, that's what martial arts is about. It's not about being forceful. It's about taking your energy and sending it right back to you, which right. I did. Just caught you your did, strike. Boom. Send it he, right back. Right back and hit you right in the dick. You took the wind out of my sails. I am a distressed boat at sea during this interview now, just so you know. Uh, we are not all star-crossed lovers like you right now, going through the cosmos, enjoying life. Uh, what uh, what solar system are you doing this interview from? Uh, I am uh, – this is – Oh God! You're, so now, now you've put me on the spot with the improv here. This is uh, Galaxy X Y Z six four three. It's three past the Milky Way. If that uh, if that makes any sense, I don't know if you've been around it's these parts. This but, time uh, of year there. No, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful, yeah. Beautiful. Nice, Mike, nice purple haze around here. Yeah. Mike, uh, first of all, I'm going to start the questioning off with a. I I've become a big fan of yours over the last year. And your name, I'd say, popped up four or five years ago on several different lists. You know, those I, I don't want to use the word indie wrestlers you've never heard of or, you know, the breakout star of X, Y and Z year or the solar system you're in. But when when you're coming up and you see these names on, on those lists and you think I'm almost there, people are writing about me, people are recognizing me. Is that is that kind of a a push of, all right, I'm almost there. Or at times, can it be like, why the fuck can I not break past this glass ceiling and make it to the next level? Uh, it was not, there was no question about why am I not there? I knew why. And I mean, the answer is because for five years, I couldn't enter the United States, uh, which I, you know, was fine with and dealt with. I was more than flattered to be number one on all the lists of uh, the top 10 best wrestlers you've never heard of. Uh, which I wasn't a lot. And I, I made a tweet about it uh, one time when I was on one of those lists, which is like, I, this is great, but I can't wait to be, you know, high on the list of the best wrestlers you've actually heard of, <laughs> which is finally happening. But, you know, yeah. I, I understood why I was going to be, you know, I was going to remain in that kind of uh, list of the least, least known wrestlers until I could come to the U.S. Because, of course, that's the biggest market in the world for professional wrestling. Yeah, but I mean, the irony of it all, when, when I think back over your career and not being able to get into the United States, and then your 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 career takes a, a, a right turn, all of a sudden now you're in Mexico and now you're doing Japan. I mean, do you have the same career? Do you, did, I mean, obviously it's going to be a little bit different, but do you ever think to yourself, if I, if I would have gotten in to America that one time, maybe this would have been a, a, a quicker road to where I'm at today? Uh, I do. I mean, I think it goes both ways. There's a good chance that I could have, you know, uh, stayed in America and and went on with Because uh, if you look at it, when I was in PWG in 2016, almost everyone else that was on that roster has gone on to WWE or AEW or New Japan or somewhere like that. And there's a good chance I would have been part of that group. And there's also, you know, a chance that I would have hated it. There's also a great chance that nothing would have happened at all. Um, it could have been a lot worse. It also could have been a lot better. There's no way for me to know is, you know, the ultimate, uh, the only wise assessment of the situation. I'm very happy with the way things did go down, though. I, I, I'm i super happy with the year I've had and where my career has taken me. So, I mean, I, I'm only grateful for the way things went down. You might be that last generation of wrestlers that I feel like had to pay their dues. You've mentioned in many different interviews in the past where you've worked five years without even seeing a cent. And then you made your first five dollars and, and, and you had to work your way up. Now, this this I'd say this generation right 
after you. Uh, the internet, social media, YouTube videos, they get, you know, they wrestle for a year and all of a sudden they're on major TV shows and, and, and stuff like that. And then we look at your work versus them not singling anybody out and you're light years ahead of these guys. Do you, and, and when people ask you for advice, because I, I feel like you're in a position now where people go, but speedball, how do I get to where you are? Speedball, what do I do here? Do you kind of say, hey, Take your time. Don't, I mean, you look, we all want to reach for the stars, but sometimes if you get there, you, you miss those puzzle pieces. Or do you try to use your experiences in like, take your time, get the building blocks and move forward or fuck, get up there. Don't be like me five years of no pay, you know? Um, I do. I absolutely think that very often the, the answer is, Hey, be patient let things happen, learn, and don't try to get ahead of yourself wrestling-wise. Um, but I will correct you uh, in that I am part of the last generation of wrestlers that had to pay their dues. It, that may be so in America. In America, that's changed tremendously. And, you know, I've had people who started wrestling, started training in 2019, and then made their debut right on AEW Dark in 2020, which is inconceivable for someone who started wrestling in 2006. But also, you have to keep in mind that there's wrestling that happens all over the world and there's a lot of people that where they're wrestling the country or the part of the world in which they are resembles quebec in 2005 where you you know you don't get paid for the first five years and you never will unless you start traveling and really do something special that's a very very common situation for a lot of pro wrestlers around the world and i try to I try to not forget that which is so I think it's important uh, I do have a lot of people that ask me for advice and I think a big part of it is not telling them what I would do or how it was for me but try to understand their situation and how it is for them and give give them the best advice based off of that well I've had the opportunity to see see you live when you've come out and done some indies at West Coast Pro over here on the West Coast I've, I've watched you do your thing and then now watching you on impact uh, on a weekly or when you know when you're on the show um one of the things I'm always impressed with is that you do bring this 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 sort of new school element but you're you you keep the psychology and whether you're doing it on the indie or you're doing it on TV how important is bringing that psychology to the to the match for you even though you you know you're you know the the thing that you're doing is the martial arts and wrestling it's the hybrid but and you would you wouldn't think there would be that much psychology in that it would just be more of a more of a, a like a fight right um one of the things that i think is extremely misunderstood in professional wrestling is context and uh and that's something i've learned from again spending 5 years traveling and going from from place to place right uh every audience exists on a spectrum somewhere between mexico and japan Right. So you have Mexico where wrestling is cultural. Everyone is going, whether they're a wrestling fan or not. They don't know the characters. They don't know the names. Uh, quite frankly, they're there to drink and they don't really look until someone in a, in a colorful outfit is flying off the top rope. They don't really care. And then in Japan, you've got promotions. DDT ran, you know, two or three times every single week. And the same 75 people came to the shows no matter where it was and knew every single character. And then you look at things like moves, right? Um, Again, I'm I'm going to nerd out on wrestling here, but you know something like a finisher. There's there's a reason you have a finishing move, right? And and on WWE television, when someone kicks out of a finishing move, it's a big deal because in the program leading up to the match, there's going to have been references to what that finishing move is, what matches they've won with it, and then when someone's going to kick out, it's going to be a big deal, right? In Japan, it's kind of the same thing. They pay so much attention, and if you like save a move and just just tease the move for months on end, then finally hit it, it'll be worth it. But like in Mexico, truly no one cares. No one cares at all. There's no promo packages. There's no names. There's no no announcers. It's a live show for the live audience that is only there to have fun. So whether things are cool or not, that's what matters above all else. And American indie wrestling lies somewhere in the middle of that, where the audience is paying attention, but also West Coast Pro runs once a month, approximately. I, I'm going to be there uh in a, in a week or so, I haven't been there in a long time. I'm not expecting the audience to remember my moveset. And that's really, 
why I think my I'm able to adapt my style to places like that is just I I understand the audience in front of which I I'm performing, and I think that's something that's heavily lacking, uh, in professional wrestling right now, especially when it comes to promoters, who simply see pro wrestling and be like, I want to do that, without trying to understand whether or not that applies to their audience. This is going to sound like the typical dumb American wrestling question. And it is, by the way, because I am very much admit that I'm a dumb American wrestling fan. But uh, when you come out of Quebec, do you already feel typecast as the kind of character you have to be? Because I think in America, when people hear a French accent or uh, French Canadian wrestlers, someone out of Quebec, we think the Quebecers, we think heel wrestlers right away. Or a brother. Yeah. There, you, yeah, exactly. By the time you break out of there, does that, does that, has that uh, stereotype washed away, or was it still there, and you felt like you had to overcome something like that? I don't think the Quebec part has at all. I don't think I was like ever typecast as Quebecois. I, I like, I think if I just pretended I was, I was American, unless someone heard me speak in a long form they wouldn't even question it but i think you know uh the fact that i when i started wrestling in the u.s i would come out in a you know my white taekwondo uniform and not looking like your typical pro wrestler with just a normal haircut and you know uh no like distinctive features uh otherwise and i i leaned heavily into that where people would just assume i'm gonna get my ass kicked and then do some really cool kicks and stunts and get the audience behind me but I, I do wish I had leaned into the Quebec part of my personality a lot more. And I think one of the biggest mistakes I made in uh, professional wrestling is uh, is not talking like this. And I think that I should have kept the accent because trying to talk properly is uh, is difficult. English is still my second language. And if I, if I talk like this all the time, then the people, they just think, oh, he's doing his best to talk English. It's, uh, it's good. But no, but now because I, I actually have a like half decent American accent. I have to be careful and try to put on good promos and stuff. And I well, put a lot of extra pressure on myself. Well, once you went into that Quebec accent, I, I thought you were going heel on us <laughs> straight, you know, because I mean, that's the thing other than maybe a Rick Martel, but even then he was a great heel in the WWE as the model. <clears throat> but you think about all the French Canadian wrestlers and you think about the great heels that they were, you know, and then you go to the Hart family. They're more that, that was the Calgary. That's you know the, on the other side over here. So that that's more the babyface kind of stuff. I mean, did you? Who were the kind of guys that you were kind of into when you're growing up? That were you catching much wrestling? Like W, uh, probably mostly WWE programming or WWF at the time. I'm sure. Yeah, I I absolutely was. Um, I am the youngest of four. And as the little brother, I could always relate to the smaller guys. So like X-Pac and the Hardy Boys very early on were some of my favorites. And I say small, like they were small compared to the other wrestlers. They're still over six feet, 200 pounds. Uh, but that's how wrestling was then. And then like as time went on, I, I really hung on a lot more to the athletic side of professional wrestling and the action. So guys like uh, Amazing Red and AJ Styles were guys that I loved watching. But of course, when I started wrestling and started getting wise to what was around me, guys like Kevin Steen and El Generico became huge inspirations and were for the longest time, uh, especially like they, they were really the only like role models I had as Canadians, because as a French right. Canadian, like Bret Hart and, and Owen and that whole side of things, I really couldn't relate to. It's so far. It's so different. And Quebec is like culturally very isolated from the rest of Canada, even wrestling wise. So, I mean, if you ask me for my, like, best Canadian wrestlers, I'm definitely going to put uh, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn on there. You, you know who this, who he left off that list? I'm Petey sure Williams. And Petey Williams. Petey yeah. Williams, yeah. Yeah, I mean, formerly of this podcast, uh, Petey. Then he went to the, to the Great North promotion. Sky place. Yeah, so... You know, he he could have been here with us now, but he chose yeah, bigger he riches. Chose, he chose he chose that place. Yeah. Other Maybe than one day someone will will come on and be like, you know who my hero is? Petey Williams. Said nobody ever. <laughs> Hi, Pete. Well, so to he's a lot of wrestlers as heroes, honestly. He is a 
Petey Williams is a wrestler's wrestler. Nice try. No, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> he's my best friend, so I can make fun of him. Yeah, no. Pete, you're not. But you know what? Speaking of wrestlers, wrestler, uh, look, you had a phenomenal 2022. You what were you, X Division Wrestler of the Year. And that's you had right. The match of the year with Josh Alexander, which, by the way, probably has been my favorite Impact match in the last five years. That's, I mean, that thing should still be going on right now. How? <laughs> How do you build off that? I mean, if you're a sports, I think fan, he did. I think he did, but I digress. Let him answer the question first. But yeah, no, yeah, Lars, you're absolutely correct. I had a pit fight. I had no. a GD pit fight. You can follow up that, that Josh match. That was a that. yeah. Let's let's talk about it. But yeah, that Josh match was a absolutely fantastic. I was so glad that we got to go in there for an hour because honestly. In, uh, Josh was one of the big reasons that I joined uh, Impact. Him telling me how great it was there and having, you know, re-signing for another contract and because he enjoyed it so much over there was a big part of me joining. He and I had wrestled uh, many, many times. I, I signed my Impact contract literally off his back. And of course, as champion, he's someone that I'd been looking at ever since I first got there. Let's talk about this, you know, you and Kenny King doing the pit fight. I mean, this match, you've see, I've seen that kind of wrestling before, you know, and I've always enjoyed it. But the way that you guys did it was some next level entertainment stuff with it. Normally, I feel like the, those matches, they're, they're very hit and miss. You guys, it was a huge hit. So, you, you, you know, you, you, you and Josh have an incredible match. And then you and Kenny King have something that I think almost outshines what you and Josh did in a different way. But as an overall picture, I think it really made to, brought you into another level. Um, did you, I mean, whose idea was to do this and how did you pitch it to Scott Demore? How did you get it past him? Um, so it was, it was Kenny's idea uh, to have, to have a, a, pit fight originally um but i like it was time for me at impact to go into a feud with someone and kind of show a different side of my personality other than just you know good in-ring wrestler guy that's good as having matches which is you know fun and very important professional wrestling but i can't be only that um but yeah i think those uh the shows like blood sports uh that happens at the collective and wxw ambition which is still you know shoot rules yeah. uh is is great on a on a weekend like the collective and on shows like Ambition because it really, you know, lets the let lets the wrestlers show a different side and a different set of skills. And when the whole show is that, like realism is a huge part of making that exciting, which is not something that we had for the the pit fight. You know, it needed to be more exciting for a broader pro wrestling audience than you know those those uh blood sport or ambition shows that happen within like a, a weekend of shows. So I thought, you know, taking that, that concept, that element of the like MMA style and pushing it to like street fight, uh, and, and all the big stunts that you'd see in your average, you know, feud blow off match, uh, was definitely the way to go. And it made it extremely exciting. And I couldn't be happier with how that match came out. You, you're at the top of your game right now with your in-ring work. And the one thing I think Lars and I talk about uh, every so often on the show is wrestlers who get to a certain level, get comfortable, and never really evolve their in-ring work. What do you do to make sure you progress or evolve yourself to stay fresh? So I think that's a very – like. It's a choice that happens for a lot of wrestlers, right? They reach a certain le level and then they take the focus away from the, uh, their in-ring work, right? You reach a ceiling where that actually becomes less important. But I, I, like I, I'm still very focused on it. And I'm, I expect there will become a point in my career as I get older where I will pull the focus away from, from the in-ring work and, you know, focus on... Different aspects of professional wrestling, different aspects tangentially related to professional wrestling. Like I've been actively focused on uh, social media and content creation a lot this year because, of course, that's now that I am with Impact, now that I appear on television uh, every week, that becomes a lot more rewarding. 
Um, but I, I definitely think just being mindful is a huge part of it in terms of, of progress and paying attention to what's happening and what's good and trying to understand why it's good and why it works and how you can use that for yourself rather than, you know, just, just thinking that you're good. Cause it's very easy to get in a bubble where you think that what you're doing is right because you're successful and what everyone else is doing is wrong. Where very often what you're doing is right because you got there, but that certainly doesn't mean that anyone less successful than you is not doing it as well. You know, I, I, you know, when I, when I, when I've seen your career and, and, you know, I've, I've, I've seen some of your matches in DDT, I've been to a few DDT live shows and you're right there. It is a lot of the, the same people. I went to two nights, one, one at Kurikin and the next night, no, I think it was like Osaka or Nagoya, one of the two, but I, I went to two nights in a row, long story short, there must've been a lot of people coming out and expressing interest for you. I'm sure a lot of the big companies uh, maybe tried to romance you to their side of the fence. My question to you is, you know, I, you know, although you are an impact, is there, it's actually probably a two part question is, is this just a stopover for you or is this a place where you would think that you could basically spend your career? Uh, I could absolutely spend my career, my career at impact. Um, but that like saying that simply feels disingenuous because even before I signed with impact, like there is much more that goes behind where am I going to spend the next, you know, several years of my career uh, then just, as I'm sure, you know, uh, as I'm sure you're a man who signed many a contract, oh, yeah. you know, that there's a lot of different numbers and aspects that go behind all of this. And it's never as simple as, Oh, I like this place better. Um, however, what I can say is I think the, the growth curve that impact is on is absolutely fantastic. And I don't want to take all the credit for it, but I do want to take as much of the credit as I can for it. Uh, <laughs> if things are going very well right now, uh, and I, you know, uh, I've got a lot of time to contemplate my options. And if things keep going the way they are, I'd love to stay with Impact. Well, because see, here's my, my, my thought process with you. Two years ago, Speedball Mike Bailey could, probably couldn't have been the same Speedball Mike Bailey, let's say, in the WWE. Um, now, it seems like that creative has changed and there's a little bit more, you know, creative freedom. You've you've got a 15 year career, right? So yes, and as you said, there's a lot to consider before you sign a contract. I always ask this question, especially to the to the to the gentleman who spent over a decade. Now that you've enjoyed this creative freedom, where you can do something like a pit fight, you know, you can you can you can have great matches, longer matches with, you know, Josh Alexander, etc. Do you feel like that creative freedom is more important than the pocketbook? That uh, again, so not to not to simplify things, but there's a number that you could assign to that creative freedom. I don't know what that number is, and there's a number you could assign to no creative freedom. If you paid me a billion dollars a year to stay home and do nothing, I would most likely take that for a couple of years. I'm trying to buy a house here. Um, creative freedom is nice, but you know, well, I mean, but that's, that's, well, that's, I mean, for me now, 51 years old and I've, you know, had platinum records and I've been around the world, you know, 50 times and I've seen and done a lot of things. And it's like, if it's, there's, you know, for me, my choices is like, you know, if I'm going to leave my door, you know, if it's for 300 bucks, is it going to be worth it? Right. You know, because I'm going to be able to express myself in a place that I want to express it. Even if it's a million dollars to put me on some fucking stupid car commercial, I'm probably not going to do that just because money don't mean shit. It's come and go. You can wipe your ass with it. Or you can burn it and you can spend it. And at the end of the day, you're probably going to lose it because the whole world's going to end. So my point is, is like where you're at right now, do you think Mike Speedball Bailey, who you are right now, could be anywhere else in the world doing the exact same thing? So I absolutely think uh, not only that, but... Uh, in in 2021, I, I briefly accepted an offer uh, from from NXT. Uh, was it 2021 to 2020? I can't even remember. Uh, either or, I, I briefly accepted an offer to go to go work for NXT, which I was very excited about. But 
a big part of that was knowing that I am a very, very good professional wrestler. Like yeah. I'm excellent at professional wrestling. And I, and I know this and I feel like if I signed to a promotion for a lot of money and they decided that they wanted me to be, let's say, uh, a literal clown who's a, whose gimmick is that he farts around and that, that's how he moves. He moves with his farts. I would still be able to put on excellent professional wrestling. And I, I have that confidence. And, uh, you know, that, that of course, will does and probably plays a role in, in where I eventually end up. Well, I, I see this as a future angle, Dennis. Like when he does make it up. Oh north, no, it was not a pitch. Not a pitch. It could be. Don't Dan, pitch he, it. It's it's like Doink's nephew farts. Farts uh, the clown. People at Fightful, if you're going to write oh an article, God, please, please write one over the Quebec farting clown angle because <laughs> I cannot wait to see headlines all over the internet. Speedball Mike Bailey wants to be a farting clown in NXT. <laughs> I, thanks for coming on. Thank <laughs> we, we we got everything we need, Mike. No, no good okay, one, good. <laughs> oh man, I I should have known better. God, that's Trick on me. <laughs> but you know, uh, kind of speaking a little bit to what Lars was talking about, you, you get married. Uh, you know, I don't know if there are plans for a family or not, but how does that affect your wrestling career? But now that you're, you know, a a married married person, you are either building but you now have responsibilities you talk about buying a house does does that change how you take bookings does that change how maybe you even wrestle in the ring because you see a lot of these old guys that can't walk around they've got the bad back bad knee uh how's that change your perspective on the industry um it truly doesn't i've always played the for the long term and like it also it's the thing that I'm the most proud of, the area in which I'm the best at in professional wrestling is being safe and doing the stunts that look as crazy as possible without, you know, actually having the risk of injuring, really paring down. Oh, this looks crazy, but is actually fine with uh, this is a big bump that I wouldn't want to take every match. That's probably the, the biggest thing. Um, but also, yeah, I've always looked at, at the, you know, a long term career goal. I mean, since uh, I want to say for about. 10 years when I realized that wrestling, you know, was going to work out for me is when I, I really, you know, have been playing the long game. And and that helped me a lot during those five years. I couldn't stay in the U.S. to be able to look ahead and be like, OK, I'm going to now start building up my name so that in five years I can end up where I am now. Well, do you think, uh, you know, because you obviously mentioned NXT that obviously didn't work out to for whatever reason. Um was that a defining moment to where you are now? I mean, it was part of it, but not really. It was uh, the 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 whole, uh, you know, contract signing and courtship process between all the major companies is not as romantic as people make it out to be. I mean, the finality was, and the way I signed my contract with Impact was absolutely, you know, uh, dramatic and pro wrestling -y in the best way possible but there's a long process that goes before that and it's the same for everyone and man i'm sure there's a lot of big gigantic surprise returns and company changes that actually like boiled down to one specific clause in the contract about rights or royalties or whatever that didn't work out are you Understood. are you giving us a hint on why you uh, your contract didn't follow work through with the hints of uh, royalties and clauses? Well, royalties? No, I wish we were actually talking about royalties. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> but you know, uh, becoming a fan of yours, uh, watching your I I love Impact Wrestling. I you know with PD, I followed him to all these different shows, and we've interviewed enough guys where they say. Uh, they had that moment with WWE or NXT and it either fell short or didn't happen. And they talk about how devastated they were or how worried that that was their opportunity and it didn't uh, pan out and they didn't know what they were going to do next. It sounds like you were just like, whatever, I'm going to be all right. I'm speedball Mike Bailey. What's next? Was that kind of so what happened? Y yes. It sucked. You know, it sucks. I was, I was annoyed. Uh, of course, but also, and this is something I was talking about with Josh Alexander when we had that 
60 minute match. I, I started wrestling in 2006 and again for no money. And I worked as a janitor for a very long time. And there was a point in my life where I was, you know, uh, I was cleaning a university during the, during the night and I was uh, training for boxing matches and Taekwondo tournaments. And I was studying in university and I was professional wrestling. And like Josh also worked, you know, shortly before he signed with impact, he was still working construction. He broke his neck shortly before that and thought he would never wrestle again. So for us wrestling an hour was like, yeah, this is fucking great. We get to do what we love for an hour in the ring when people were like, oh man, isn't this hard? And I feel like people take wrestling like that way a lot. Man, you got fired by the WWE. That means you work there. That means you now have an extra million followers on Twitter and you're now the pick of the litter. You now have so much extra cachet that you get to take and go and use to do whatever it is that you want in the world of wrestling. I feel like, you know, there's a... It, it's being fired by W is not the worst thing. Uh, th that being said, there are some cases where like you're reliant on them for a visa and your your uh, wife is pregnant and you're suddenly fired where that really fucking sucks. But for the most part, nah, you're going to be able to make six figures doing professional wrestling of all things for another while longer. So maybe you're good. That's fair. Now, do you still enjoy uh, doing the indies? Do you like having that freedom that you can come to the places that, you know, most yes. companies maybe wouldn't allow you? Yes, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. I, I love independent wrestling. I love pro wrestling. I love wrestling in front of 30 people just as much as I love wrestling in front of 5,000. Um, I mean, I, I you, you, I'm sure you can relate to that, right? They pay you to travel and you do the shows for free. It's kind of, yeah, it's pretty much, it's like, I almost feel like the payment at the end of the show was just to get me on that airplane. Right. Know? Yeah. It it boggles my mind talking to wrestlers who don't wrestlers who are like, ugh, I have to go and have a match today, which like, I understand if you're injured and you're working through injuries to, to do that, or if, you know, you have something going on, but for the most part, man, you're play fighting, just go and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. As a successful podcaster, I feel the same way, guys, when people pay me to go somewhere to podcast. So I just want to jump in on this and let you both know that uh, I know what you guys are talking about. Thanks. Do, do you do a lot of traveling for podcasting? None. <laughs> well, he obviously came to your galaxy today, right? Mike. I, I did. Uh, you you know, I was listening to one of your podcasts with uh, Chris Van Vliet, and I'm a huge fan of his, uh, The Insightful Podcast. And listen to that, then I listen to another one, then I listen to another one. You are a hard person not to not like. Not that I went in going, I'm not, I don't want to like this guy. Uh, how and, and your personality translates well on TV. So you're one of these guys I view as a career face character. And you talk to wrestlers and they're always like, oh, it's fun to play the heel. But even in your interviews, when you talk about how you, you know, you were doing uh, MMA stuff and you didn't really want to hurt anybody, wrestling was built just for you and you like doing it and you never trash talked anybody. Does playing the hill character, is that something that really uh, intrigues you or are you just happy to be the face guy? So I am a heel on independent shows. And again, depending on the on the context, right? When the audience d doesn't know me, doesn't know who I am, or even if they do, sometimes it works better. Uh, but on independent shows, I am a heel about half the time, maybe even more than that. Uh, I I enjoy it. I, you know, I think mostly it's just being a good professional wrestler and doing things like, you know, just taking away the action and letting the other person be the fun part of the match so that you can be the less you know, uh, fun of the match when it counts and then bring that back and playing with that in order to, you know, manipulate the audience into watching a, a fun pro wrestling match um, is a thing that I'm super comfortable with and can do very easily. That being said, I've never been like a long-term heel on television or in sterilines because again, I've never, I haven't wrestled in a, for a promotion that would, that would call for that or where that would be a thing. But I... I feel like I would be good at it. I feel like it works very well. I feel like, uh, you know, the 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 same way I am likable works well as a heel when I am doing something terrible, but still presenting the same, uh, you know, 
happy-go-lucky guy, I feel like that works quite well. I guess if I had a last question, I was reading some somewhere, and I can't remember who was talking about it, but you know the 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 era of calling stuff in the ring, and I'm sure because you have over a 15 year career, you probably know how to do that. Um, do you find that uh, maybe you're doing less of that these days or are you doing it at all? Or do you like doing it? Or what, what is your preferred way to do a match? Do you want to work some of it, all of it out in the back or just kind of go and work off the crowd? Um, I think there's a, uh, again, there's a balance that always works. Of course, you can't, you can't call anything and it always depends on the length and like you have to work with your opponent. That's the thing about pro wrestling. You're never doing it, it alone. It's never entirely my choice, whether I want to call it all in the back or if I want to, you know, do it all in the fly, there's usually going to be a, a give or take, and there's going to be an agreement on how we want to do this match. And, and like, I'm, I'm okay. happy to do most of it. Hypothetically, on the yes, hypothetically, go. I'm your opponent. Yes. And, and you go, okay, what are we doing today? Or I'm going, what are we doing today? And Or you ask me that question. I go, let's just call it in the ring. How does that feel to you? That feels fine. Okay. I mean, it depends on the context. If you want to do that on, on, on TV, I feel like it won't be very good. Right. You know, because you got on, cameras and everything else. And we need to tell our producers what we're doing and we need to time it out specifically and you know, but I, I feel like it'll be fine. Uh, I'm comfortable wrestling on the fly. That's certainly not an issue. the The issue is that you know, for my skill set, uh, doing a lot of big stunts is what uh, I'm best at. And right. and you know, by taking that away from me, you'd have uh, I'd be you know like handicapping myself a little bit. But it it happened very recently, and I had a uh, a a like 15 minute ish match with a, uh, a a very experienced professional wrestler whose memory was not not quite so good anymore but we maybe prepared the last like 3 minutes and then just went at it for the first 12 and it was great wow nobody likes chris saban so that's all right another <laughs> friend so i can poke fun it wasn't him by the way so don't write about it fightful um you, you you're supposed to laugh Bailey giggle a little bit. Um, so Thursdays. At <laughs> Impact, thank you. Oh boy. You see, he, he just, he just went heel on my life. Boy, he went that heel was... on you again. That, right. You that... see, so you see going from this to just full heel, you see how much that, that just that drives laugh, it. Yeah, that, there we that, go. That laugh was so Canadian. No, I knew that he was nobody likes the Quebecs. Nobody, <laughs> uh, you know, impact Thursdays, access TV and the wrap things up for me. Uh, there's a, there's a big difference between wrestling on TV, wrestling the indies. And I know when you go to a wrestling school, nobody teaches you how to wrestle in front of a television camera. Who was the guy that really helped you along to be TV ready in the ring? Um, I want to say that Chris Hero, even though it was way before television, uh, is someone that gave me a lot of advice when working with him. And some of the things he told me really stuck with me and I, I applied to television. But I think uh, the other thing that helped me the most is just being in DDT and in Japan. And because things are very, very rigidly structured right? in terms of like how you use your time and how you build your matches and I think that really is a big part of the key to being able to have, you know, cohesive televised matches. Well, Speedball, like I said, Impact Television, make sure you watch it. Access TV, Thursday nights, what is it, 8 Central, 7 Central, uh, go DVR it or TiVo it or whatever you guys do. With or the... get Impact Plus. Oh, Impact Plus, yes. Like so me. Make sure you go... And Mike, where can people find you? Do you have any shows coming up? We're really excited and we're super thankful that you took the time out to talk to us. Oh man, I have so many shows coming up. I couldn't even uh, begin to tell that's you. All. That's all we I'll be all at Pro Wrestling Revolver uh, Thursday, February 2nd. I will be at Garden State February 3rd. Uh, West Coast on February 4th. Hood Slam on the 5th. 
Uh, I can be found also on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Speedball Bailey. I have a YouTube channel, Speedball Mike Bailey on YouTube. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Speedball Bailey. But if you would like to find and support me, the best thing you can do is just go on YouTube, put in Speedball Mike Bailey in the search bar. I've got loads of great impact matches. The one hour match with Josh Alexander and the pit fight are all up there for free. Watch them. And if you like them, please share them. Mike Bailey, thank you so much for carving out a few minutes tonight to talk to Lars and myself. We are deeply appreciative, and hopefully we'll have you on again. Thank you guys so much for having me.